Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. That's what I'm talking about. My name is Henry Louis Gates, Jr. I give special thanks and special acknowledgement to members of the Hutchins Center's advisory board who are with us this afternoon, people whose generosity makes all of the work that we do possible. So when I say your name, please stand up. Shahara Ahmad Llewellyn, Bennett Ashley, looks like our board members are late, <laughs> Carol Biondi, ah, good. <laughs> Richard Cohen, Richard Cohen always comes in late because he knows I embarrass him. Um, Richard Cohen recently agreed to become both the vice chair of our board and the chair of our new Cooper Gallery for African and African American Art. And he's already donated several contemporary masterpieces to create our permanent collection. Richard is my go-to guy and a very dear friend through thick and through thin. He's a bad guy. Virgis Colbert, right there. Nancy Garvey. I want you to see Nancy Garvey because Nancy Garvey is the result of a genetic miracle. She, her great-grandfather is Marcus Garvey. <laughs> Jeremy Henderson's coming a little bit later. Mitch and Frida Kapoor. <laughs> Gerald Pearl. <laughs> Doug Schoen, the famous writer and journalist. And Davis Weinstock. <laughs> Give it up for the members of our advisory board, please. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you all know that at far too many of our colleges and universities, black studies and ethnic studies still unfairly are forced to struggle for their very existence. But we're able to focus on creative research and programming because of the financial support of these people, the financial support of our advisory board, a board conceived of and headed by a man I actually met in this very church. Now, I said it at the top that um, the Old Welling Church was a magical place, and you could feel it. But it's also a place where miracles can occur, and I know that because one day in this very church, after this very event, a tall, lanky white guy walked up to me and said that he'd been attending these panel discussions for the last few years. He'd been watching what we do, and he decided to direct his donation for his 25th class reunion at Harvard College to the Du Bois Institute. So I thanked him. You know, I looked at him, he had a pair of flip-flops on, old raggedy t-shirt and a pair of shorts, and I figured he was gonna give us $500. And a couple weeks later, I got this irate call from the Harvard Development Office asking how dare I approach Glenn Hutchins for a donation? Because, you see, you gotta get permission at Harvard to approach rich people. <laughs> you can't just call Bill Gates and ask him for a loan or a donation, right? And if you ask for permission, you never get permission. So I told him the, the truth, which is I had no idea who Glenn Hutchins was. And the guy said, well, that's a ton of crap because I'm holding a check for a million dollars. Now, every year I come back to the old whaling church. I hang around out back. Ask if anybody wants a photograph, a selfie. <laughs> Since that time, this man has endowed at Harvard the world's largest research center dedicated to African and African American studies, and he has become the largest single donor, now get this, the largest single donor to the study of race and or ethnicity in the history of the United States. He's very active. He's a very active, indeed proactive, interactive chair of our board. Effectively, he is the co-chair with me of our executive committee, and he's become one of my closest and most valued friends. Ladies and gentlemen, please, please give it up for my brother from another mother, Glenn Hutch, right there.
Now that guy that just walked in with the white hair, I told you he always does this. That is Richard Cohen, the guy who is creating our art gallery, the largest art gallery dedicated to both African and African American art in the American Academy. Richard's my go-to guy, the vice chair of our board and the chair of the Cooper Gallery. Stand up, Richard Cohen, and you gotta take it. Now we've had quite a year in Cambridge, the Ethelbert Cooper Gallery of African, Amer African American Art, designed by the great David Ajay, opened to rave reviews, and to launch it, last summer we hosted our biggest Hutchins Center Honors event yet, at which we presented the coveted Du Bois Medal, Harvard's highest honor for contributions to African and African American life and culture, to David Ajay, who is here, and where's David Ajay? David I.J. stand up. He designed our gallery, but he's designing the natural, National African American um, Museum on the Mall. Let's give it up for that brother there. So we gave the Du Bois Medal, du Bois Medal to David I.J., to Maya Angelou posthumously, to Harry Belafonte, to John Lewis, to Shonda Rhimes, Harvey Weinstein, and to someone from Chicago named Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> Our year has been filled with lectures, with exhibits, with symposia and workshops, and with all kinds of scholarly events. And we sponsor ongoing research projects that span the reach of the African diaspora, meaning not only in Africa, the Caribbean, Afro-Latin America, and Black America, but throughout the entire world, including Europe and India, Asia, and Russia. We explore, we question, we interrogate, and we celebrate the black experience universally. And the Hutchins Forum here at the Old Whaling Church is the place where we inaugurate this work each new academic year. But ladies and gentlemen, despite the triumphs of the past year, we can't deny that it was a bruising year. As bruising as many of us can remember, to tell you the truth. Today we're examining the topic, black millennials, they rock, but can they rule? The deaths of Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Walter Scott, Freddie Gray, my friend, Senator and Reverend Clementa Pinckney, and the other eight victims in Charleston, Sandra Bland, as well as others too numerous to name, but whose lives and sacrifices matter no less. Their losses shocked us all, and shocked some of us to organization and action. And that's why Charlene felt that there could be no more appropriate time for us to think hard about how the young activists of today can become the leaders and political actors of our society tomorrow that we so urgently need, and how they can affect meaningful and lasting change in this country. And that's what we're here to, to explore this afternoon. And now it's August. August, August is when bad things traditionally often seem to have happened to black people in this country. And August is also when black people and their allies rise up to do something about it. DeRay McKesson, one of the speakers you're gonna hear from today, doesn't like to say that he's on the front lines of black millennial activism, but I'll say it. He's on the front lines. And he had something in an essay for The Guardian two weeks ago that I'd like to share with you this afternoon. And this is what he wrote. We didn't discover injustice, nor did we invent resistance last August. Being black in America, he writes, means that we exist in a legacy of tradition and protest, a legacy and tradition as old as this America. And in many ways, August is the month of our discontent. This August, he continues, we remember Mike Brown, but we also remember the Watts Rebellion and the trauma of Katrina, three distinct periods of resistance prompted or exacerbated by police violence. So we are here this afternoon at the Old Whaling Church in August to listen to DeRay and the other activists assembled on this stage talk with Charlene about movements and moments, strategy and action. And who better to guide this exploration than my dear friend and sister, Charlene hunter Gold? Charlene hunter Gold, who came to our nation's attention in 1961 when she and Hamilton Holmes were the first black students admitted to the University of Georgia after a series of court challenges, exhausted media attention, and violent demonstrations on the Athens campus. Demonstrations that I watched, like many of you did in this audience, that I watched in our living room 
with my parents on our small black and white TV set when I was 10 years old. Now, if someone had told me that I would one day get to know this young woman whose courage was so palpable, even to a little kid in the fifth grade growing up in the hills of West Virginia, I would have laughed in their face. But that's another miracle that came to pass. Charlene has been a hero to me ever since that day when I saw her bravery, her composure, and grace, her certainty of step, even under siege, even through the lens of a little black and white TV. Charlene is the author of the memoir, In My Place, News Out of Nowhere, Uncovering Africans' Renaissance, To the Mountaintop, My Journey Through the Civil Rights Movement, and most recently, her ebook on Amazon called Corrective Rape, about the horrific practice by some South African men of raping lesbians to correct their sexual orientation. Her latest PBS series is devoted to race solutions and is entitled Race Today. And her second interview in this timely series is scheduled for next week. In the current New Yorker, Charlene has published a postscript on the life of her friend Julian Bond, who unfortunately passed less than a week ago. And what she said about Julian's view of consciousness might serve to frame our thinking about the discussion about to ensue this afternoon. In an address to the Southern Conference Educational Fund, Julian Charlene writes, discuss the trajectory of the movement and how the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964 had changed its tenor, making people complacent, making them think that the victory had been won. In his soft-spoken but firm and confident way, she continues, Julian went on to suggest that this apparent victory had sapped the movement's support. Lack of interest is more killing than lack of money, he said. Negroes must not forget race consciousness as long as they are the victims of racism. We read these words today, ladies and gentlemen, with a shudder of recognition, not as a description of a chapter long ago in the distant memory of the civil rights movement, but more as a prophecy of things that unfortunately have come to pass. It's just one of so many examples of the ways in which Julian Bond, that lion of the movement, whose urbane exterior belied a fierceness rarely matched in eloquence and efficacy, ways in which this man, Julian Bond, was a man way ahead of his times. We will miss Julian's elegant wisdom his humor and his wit, his stubborn hard-headedness, the clarity of his analysis, his relentless commitment to justice and freedom, and indeed, his unbending determination that our society narrow its profoundly unsettling gap between the reality of race in America and our country's own professed ideals about equality and justice and justice for all. For all of these reasons, it's only fitting that we dedicate today's panel to the life and memory of Julian Bond. Our moderator, Charlene Hunter Gold, is that rarest of public figures, a chronicler and historian of our society's complex life and times, and all the while, a history maker herself. Hers are also the guiding hands and brilliant mind that make our annual panel discussion here at the Old Whaling Church such a compelling event. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for the great, inimitable Charlene hunter Go. many of these millennials and those I haven't met, I read about. It seems like millennials are making news big time almost every day. And there are some 80 million millennials born approximately between 1980 and 1995 the generation following the baby boomers who are now close to 60. Unfortunately, I'm a little bit past that group too. Uh, (laughs) But the picture that emerges about these millennials is complex. On the one hand, I've read that millennials are, uh, can we do anything about this feedback here? It's driving me a little crazy. 
I've read that millennials are self-centered. Don't get upset. I got some more to say. Careerist and politically dispassionate, also dubbed Generation Me, full of a sense of entitlement and narcissism. They even made 60 Minutes Morally Safer, who had this to say. The workplace has become a psychological battlefield, and the millennials have the upper hand because they are tech savvy with every gadget imaginable, almost becoming an extension of their bodies. They multitask, talk, walk, listen, and type and text. And their priorities are simple. They come first. Stay. Be calm, be calm over there. Just ask Miriam Salzman, an aid agency, exec agency executive who's been managing and tracking millennials since they entered the workforce. Some of them, she said, are the greatest generation. They're more hardworking. They have tools to get things done. They are enormously clever and resourceful. Some of the others are absolutely incorrigible. It's their way or the highway. The rest of us are old, redundant, should be retired. How dare we come in anyone over 30? Not only can't we be trusted, can't be counted upon, can't be coherent. And then there are those who fit the description of being more civic-minded, taking to the streets on an almost daily basis, from Occupy Wall Street protesters to, have, to those who have made hands up, don't shoot, and Black Lives Matter mantras heard around the world. So today, we're going to hear from some black millennials where they see themselves in the world today and tomorrow. And by tomorrow, I don't mean Friday, the next, you know, you know. But tomorrow in about 30 some years when the current minority that they are a part of become the majority in this country. And so, you have your programs there with extensive biographies, and those of you who've been to this panel before know that my one condition is that everybody on the panel as well as in the audience when we get to your questions be pithy and brief. And I'm gonna follow my own directive and tell you to consult your programs for the full biographies of these wonderful people, but I'm going to introduce them now, pithily and briefly. <laughs> so. Charles Coleman Jr. is a New York-based civil rights attorney who has just missed being classified as a millennial by a couple of years. So he has a perspective on them. Is that right? Pretty close. One year, okay. <laughs> but he's got a perspective that ain't one, okay? <laughs> Orlando Watson is spokesman and communications director for black media for the Republican National Committee. Dion Rabuin is the weekend editor of the International Business Times. And DeRay, not D-Ray, you Southerners like myself, that's what I've been calling him. But like, I don't like somebody to call me something other than Charlene. DeRay McKesson is an educator with the Minneapolis Public School System and a member of the organization We the Protesters, which organizes protests that center on African American issues. And as you know, uh, probably those of you who read newspapers either online or in your living room on paper, you know D. Ray has not only been active in Ferguson and other places where young black men have been uh, murdered, but he has also uh, been arrested for his participation, and we thank him for seeing to it that he got out of jail <laughs> in order to be here with us today. <laughs> now, I'm not gonna tell you what he's gonna do tomorrow, so anyway, enjoy it while it lasts. Okay, thank you. Janae Ingram. National Executive Director of the National Action Network, a creation of the Reverend Al Sharpton. So, Janae, let me start with you. You heard, I hope you were listening, because you were giving me the eye as I read about all these things they say about millennials. So, 
where do you fit into the description that I just laid out, and how different are black millennials from white ones? Well, wow. I'm kind of loud, so I'm, I'm going to try to sit a little bit back from the mic. First, I want to thank, um, oh, we need you to turn Everybody yours turn off. yours off if you're not speaking. Um, I want to thank the Hutchins Center and Glenn and Dr. Gates and Charlene for inviting me to this panel. Um, so yes, I was listening and I'm a cusper like Charles, so I'm kind of right there in between. But I would say in terms of who I am, um, I definitely am the hardworking, civically minded uh, activist type, right? Right. <laughs> The other stuff, I don't know who they were talking about, but I don't, I don't know those types of people. And how different are you, you think, as a black millennial from white millennials? And I know I'm calling for generalizations here, which right. I hate, but maybe you can speak to it. Yeah, I mean, I think um, given the context of where we are in America, and yes, we have had progress, but I think there's still a lot of progress to go. Um, there is a difference between black millennials and white millennials. Um, white millennials who um, grow up in a system where they are afforded a lot of opportunities that just aren't generally given to black millennials. And again, we are de dealing with gross um, generalizations, but I do think in a lot of ways, black millennials are still forced um, to deal with issues of inequality in the, in, in the system of life. So whether that is um, being the first in your family to go to college and dealing with that reality um, of having to navigate how do you pay for college, how do you apply for college, all of the things that happen there, um, to dealing with being able to get a job once you're out of college. I think not having those networks and those relationships um, and so much more. So I think in general, Black millennials do have to work harder. Um, and then not to talk about, I mean, well, I guess to talk about the fact that right now in the context and the state of where we are in dealing with so many inequalities in terms of policing and police interaction, racial profiling, um, that becomes a constant reality that we have to face on a day-to-day -day basis that I don't think white millennials have even given a consideration. So what is your organization doing about it? Well, we have very active youth um, in our organization. We have um, NAN's Youth Move. Um, they are people who are 12, 13 years old who are organizing um, specifically around the issues of criminal justice reform. We have our NAN Youth Huddle. Um, they come together to talk about every issue under the sun, whether it's LGBTQ rights, whether it's um, expressing themselves and, and coming together, talking about summer employment, talking, just talking about whatever issues they think are important and, and dealing with in the moment. And it's a weekly occurrence. It happens in cities across the country. I um, mean, we have a Young Professionals League who are working young professionals that are inside organizations working to encourage others to be, you know, open the door for others, if you will. Um, working from the inside, because I think that that's an, another important piece. You have to have an inside-outside game. So I think we have done that pretty well with, with all of our youth sort of organizing from different perspectives. Thank you so much. We'll come back to you in a little bit. DeRay, what is your reaction to the definition? I've given two different sets, definitions of millennials. So tell me what your, where you fall, you think, and how you think the black millennials differ from others. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with, so before I start, I'll say that I no longer work for Minneapolis Public Schools. <laughs> I used to, uh, I quit in March, but I, so I, I'm a, I don't work for anybody right now, um, but I used to work for Minneapolis. So I'm okay with Generation Me, right? In, in the sense that I think that so many people in my generation are trying to get free, and if Generation Me means that people are willing to put their bodies and lives on the line for what they believe in, then I'm okay with that, if that's how people think about us. I think about Ferguson as a place where so many people told us to go home, so many people told us this wasn't the way to fight, so many people told us it would be over tomorrow, and we said, like, I believe something differently, and I'm gonna do it. So if that is how, like, people, if, if, if that is what people pervert selfishness to be, then we can take that and, like, ride with it, and we can say, like, we're still here. Um, 
So that'll be my like response about the critique of the generation. I do think that we have more access to, to information in each other. You know what what is so powerful. So I love Twitter. I'm a big Twitter person. Twitter all day. You want to um, give out your Twitter name, no, everybody? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's just my first name. But but there is something about you know like we always face issues of erasure. I'm um, an erasure man. Black people and erasure manifests in two ways. One is that either the story is never told or it's told by everybody but us. And when I think about Ferguson, we literally became unerased. Um, and it was really powerful because we got to connect with each other differently in a way that, that mattered. Um, not only did we get to use the platform to push back on dominant culture narratives, but we got to talk to each other and meet each other and become friends and family digitally first. And that matters. And that was a, a person to person. It was a me to me sort of, or me to you sort of thing. So when I think about Generation Me, you know, immediately when you said it, I was like, we're trying to get free. And we're trying to do it in whatever way we think makes sense to us. And again, I think about so many people who told us to go home and didn't support us last August and told us we were being foolish. And those are the same people who can't stop calling today. Thank you. Let, let me just follow up briefly, though, and ask you, because when I looked at Ferguson and all these other places that you've been and so forth, um, the crowds are interracial as they were during the Civil Rights Movement. How do you see that and the participation of whites in the movements that you've been so closely identified with? Yeah, we won't get free alone, right? Like that is real, that's as real as I could say it. Um, that it'll take many people understanding this work and understanding like how to fight in it. I think white people, what white people can do is use their privilege to disrupt, right? White privilege is real, I didn't make it up, like it's, and that's not a secret. Um, but it's like how do people use that privilege in ways that disrupt uh, racism and its impact, right? Like that is the work that white people need to do. And black people, you, I, I often think of this notion that um, white supremacy is more afraid of our unity than our rage, right? And like what the protest was such a powerful uh, reminder of is black people coming together and saying, here's what we need, right? Here's what getting free looks like. Um, and here's what our pain looks like. Um, and I think that's really powerful, but I, there is this acknowledgement that we won't get free alone, that it'll take so many people working together, but it's important that black people like lead the liberation work for black people, but other people will have to join that fight. Um, that we are not the, the majority here. We have been like intentionally disenfranchised from having resources, right? So even if we wanted to get free alone, it like is not possible. Um, and there's so many people of other races who like wanna join the fight. I think our work sometimes is helping people figure out how to enter the work, right? The allyship is an invitation, it is not a self-appointment. Um, and that is hard for some people. Some people wanna, you know, some, some people come in and take up all the space and you're like, that's not what it's like to be an ally. Um, and not everybody's ready for that conversation. Thanks, Dion. I sure would like to have been a fly on the wall in that jail cell with you. Orlando, where do you fit in this world of millennials and how does it affect what you do? Oh, did I skip? I'm sorry. But Orlando, go ahead. I'll come back. All right. Thank you. And, uh, and thank you all for inviting me to be here and join you this evening. Uh, in terms of the, the two millennial groups that, that you depicted earlier, I think that more, they're much more similar than they are different. Uh, and where they have similarities is that they have this distrust for institutions, current institutions, established institutions. For instance, I think whether you're a hardworking, civic-minded person, uh, the research has shown, and there, there have been surveys, I believe Pew had a survey out, that show that millennials distrust big labor, they distrust big government, they distrust big business, uh, but they do trust small business and the military. Um, now, you can also be, it, hey, th this, it was a poll. Now, you can also be, <laughs> you can also be about Generation Me, but again, uh, you don't trust the established institutions that our parents grew up with, and, and I think that's where you see people charting out their own course in life and trying something different. Uh, now, where do we as Republicans fit in? Um, I think that we've had challenges with a lot of different groups, whether they're my, uh, black, Hispanic, Asian, women, uh, millennials. Uh, that is no secret. Um, that's part of the reason why I was hired by the Republican National Committee, to help the party grow. Uh, because that, I mean, it's an acknowledgement that we must do better. Um, but I think that in terms of like millennials, uh, if we talk to them about the issues that matter most and empower them to make the decisions for themselves, I think we're better off for it. Uh, I, and I don't speak for everyone on this panel, but 
one of the big things that's been a draw to me and my political philosophy is that I would like to be given the, the freedom to choose and make my own decisions, uh, given you know, what I know uh, and given my desires and circumstances. And so I think that's true for a lot of millennials. Uh, they would like to make their own decisions. They don't want their parents telling them what they can post on Facebook or not, or what they should be Snapchatting, or if they should even have Snapchat. So uh, I think that this is just something, I mean, it, it's definitely a change in society, but, uh, but we're reaching out and we're engaging them in the, on the issues that matter to them most. So what do you do for the Republican Party? Certainly, so it's my job as the communications director for black media to inform uh, the media, what it is that we're doing specifically at the RNC uh, to better connect with black voters. And ultimately, uh, part of our goal is to put whoever the nominee is, and we've got 17 candidates running, but whoever that nominee is, we want to put them in the best position uh, to connect with black voters. So we, entered a, a, we have a joint media venture uh, with Radio One, for instance. Uh, we've hired people in places like Cleveland and Cincinnati and Detroit and Charlotte uh, who are on the ground year-round uh, being our advocates um, I mean, these are people who have credibility in the community, and you know, it's it's not enough for us to to ask black voters to to give us you know to give us their vote uh, a few weeks before the election. Um, that's like asking for someone's hand in marriage without even taking them out on a first date. Uh, so, I mean, we we've we've begun to do change things, do it differently, and ramp up our efforts. Great, thank you so much, um, Dion. Sorry, I skipped over you, but I had thought the seating order was different. So same question, where do you fit into this discussion about millennials and how does that affect what you do? Um, I, I personally think I'm, I'm both types of millennial. Uh, you know, the, the very selfish and self-centered millennial and also the hardworking, community-oriented millennial. I think most of us are. Um, I think those things have been written because in a lot of ways they're true. I, I personally kind of hate millennials. Like I, <laughs> I really do. Like I, I say I say it on an almost daily basis. Like millennials are just the worst. Um, I kind of feel like I'm a Gen Xer sometimes. But I think the you know our failings in a lot of those ways that make us a nightmare to deal with in in offices and in work settings and just you know general life situations like that are also what's made us such a dynamic generation in terms of creating change. Um, one of the things I thought it was interesting that you said was you said millennials are sort of, I, I don't know if you use this word, but politically disaffected when we're the people who elected Barack Obama. The first black president was elected because of us. You know, if you check the voting records, you check the numbers, you know, we were the ones who got involved, who came out and voted at all time high levels, who voted two to one for him, things like that. And so now you're seeing this, you know, engagement of younger voters by particularly the Clinton campaign, by the Bernie Sanders campaign. And so I, I think, you know, we are, we're very aware, we're very understanding, and we've got a lot of things at our fingertips at all times. And I think that can be annoying on a person to person level, but it's because we're, a lot of times we're informing ourselves about the world and about what's happening. And I think that's also part of being a millennial. So what do you do? So I am the weekend editor at International Business Times. Um, I'm also a, a writer. I, I write pretty often. I was in uh, Cleveland writing about uh, the sort of the city's reaction after Tamir Rice was shot. Um, in Phoenix, I wrote about how the Super Bowl was actually not um, bringing cash flow profits to most business owners. So I just kind of take on larger projects. I've been a freelancer for most of my career, kind of writing. I was in Brazil for a little while covering issues of uh, gentrification in favelas, uh, black power, um, the movement to be black or to identify oneself as black that's growing there. Um, so yeah, I, I write about stuff. People pay me for it. So you say stuff, but, but you seem to concentrate a lot on uh, problems associated with African Americans, is that a large part of your brief? Yeah, yeah absolutely, because I'm black, so I, <laughs> you know, like, I just, no, I, I just, I write about things that I find interesting, and because I am black, a lot of the things that I find interesting have to do with our people and what we're going through, because Thank I you. see it. Thank you. All right, Charles Coleman, plus one, age of millennials. Uh, you you uh, just passed that age, as I said earlier. What is your biggest... Well, first of all, tell us briefly what you do, and then tell us briefly what your concern is about millennials. So now that I've been identified as old man winter <laughs> on the panel, no pressure at all to fit in with the young crowd, right? Um, 
In terms of what I do, it's funny, when you just asked Dion that question, I was thinking to myself, man, what am I going to start with? Um, I do a lot of different things. I, you know, jokingly refer to myself, halfway joking, halfway serious, as a black superhero. Um, I'm a writer. Uh, I write for a lot of different outlets with respect to race, politics, culture, and the law primarily, um, and, and what the impact is of the law with respect to certain decisions, things that have come down, cases that people need to be watching, and why they should matter to us. Um, there's this very interesting paradigm between America's long-standing love affair with black culture, and then on the other end, America's just seemingly ceaseless hatred of black people, and sort of trying to bridge that gap with respect to putting things in the appropriate context is a lot of what I write about. Um, professionally, in terms of my nine to five job, I'm a civil rights attorney. That's what I do. I fight for people's rights and equality with respect to injustice. I'm a former prosecutor. And so all of these experiences have sort of kind of culminated into making me what I am. And then on the other, other side, my other side hustle is that I have a mentoring program that I started called Edge Movement New York City. And it's a program where we work with young men, uh, primarily between 13 and, and 18 of age. Uh, and, and we teach them life skills. We teach them how to interact with other young men of color in positive ways that don't involve gun violence, that don't involve illicit criminal activity. And we sort of teach them how to take control of their own narrative. Because I think that that's a huge part of what we need to focus on as a community and as a people. Uh, DeRay talked about this overarching theme of freedom. And I think that, you know, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine uh, not too long ago, and they said, well, if there's one thing that you could hope for, one thing that you could change, what would it be? And my answer was one word, freedom. And I think that freedom fundamentally is about the ability to take control of and to own your own narrative. We watched Trayvon Martin have a narrative that was taken away from him by the public, by the media. We watched Trayvon Martin go from being a bright 17-year-old innocent kid to someone who had a hoodie, who had smoked marijuana, who all of these things. We watched Michael Brown go from being an innocent kid who was two days away from going to college to being some thug who robbed a store from cigarillos. And, and so we have this need, particularly with our young people, to really be in control of and take control of and redefine that narrative. And so all of the work that I do is sort of centered around that one theme. How can we better define our narrative for ourselves? Because fundamentally, that's what freedom is. Thank you. <laughs> Clearly, you and Dion need to hook up. Uh, now, tell me what your biggest concern is about millennials, the black millennials. You know, Charlene, I was really hoping you were going to give me a chance to talk about my good RNC friend over here. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but I'm sure we got time for that. I'll give you that chance. I'll give you that chance. If, if I have one concern, um, so there's this conversation about anti-establishment and the system that exists and the desire to sort of change the system and this distrust of a currently existing system. And I get it. I get it that you know, the system as it is right now does not seem fair. In fact, it seems inherently unfair if you, if you watch it and you're even paying halfway attention. But I think that there has to be a balance between a desire to sort of change the system as a whole and also learn how to work within the system as best that we can to our advantage. So when I talk to certain people, I'm not going to, you know, characterize it as millennials or any, or spe specify any particular group. And we have conversations about political activism and about really getting involved and about helping clients fundraise and things of that nature. I mean, not clients, I'm sorry, candidates fundraise and things of that nature. I'm always sort of met with this notion of, oh, politics is corrupt. Politicians are corrupt, et cetera, et cetera. Well, my concern is that in the immediate future, 
meaning the next 20 to 30 years, it's very unlikely that we're going to see any sort of entirely new system. And so when you take yourself out of that conversation, you put yourself at a natural disadvantage. And so my real concern is millennials' ability, and not even their ability, because that's not a question, their willingness to sort of engage in that process in a way that's going to be beneficial to them, even if it means, yo, we're running our own candidates, and that's what we're going to do because that's what we're going to participate in. I think that that's probably my biggest concern. Uh, DeRay, you want to respond to that briefly? <laughs> Three things. Uh, one is that I worry that people, I worry sometimes that we get too addicted to the fight and not enough to the win, right? That there's like something about uh, the fight that I think can be seductive. Um, and, and let me tell you, I've been to a gazillion protests and I will go home to, I'm ready to win. Let me tell I'm ready to win. Uh, I think also that sometimes we can, be, we can be paralyzed by too many inputs. Like our, our access to information is just so great and our access to feedback and advice and, and sometimes it just becomes too much, right? Like we don't make a decision because there's one more person trying to give you advice and they tweeted it to you, texted it to you, Snapchatted it to you, put it on Facebook. Um, and that I think can be too much. I also, um, I worry that we don't, that sometimes we don't understand our own power, right? That we have not yet, that we don't know how to imagine new forms of power. So I'm all about the like, some people are like, the system just isn't working, so I'm gonna pull back. And that makes sense to me, but I want you to pull back and, do, and, and build something else, right? This idea about like, tear it all down, but like, let's have something to build once we tear it down um, is something that I worry about, especially in the movement space, right? This idea that, that part of the work will be removing barriers, and then the other part of the work will be building and rebuilding, and that sometimes we, um, again, I think can be too addicted to the fight and not enough to the win. One of, the, one of our visitors on the island um, this week was uh, DC Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton. And she was saying that she was so surprised with the Occupy movement that you know they went around and sat in parks and made a lot of noise, but when they came to Washington DC, they only sat in the park. They did not come to Congress. They did not attempt to speak to the legislators. And so her concern was not only that organizations like Occupy have sort of drifted off into the atmosphere somewhere, but that there doesn't seem to be an end point to a lot of the protests. Now, any of you can respond to that. Um, you, 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 well, DeRay, all right, Janae, you go ahead. Um, so I think that's a really interesting point, and um, I think Charles is right, you know, when you hear people say that they don't want to be politically active because the system is corrupt, and, you know, to your point about Occupy and the fact that they were somewhat disengaged with the, the legislative process, um, at NAM we have a, a saying, a, a motto that we sort of live by, and that's demonstration to legislation. And so our, 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 the way that we work is really to both disrupt, but then to also have that conversation about how do you change laws. Um, and so if you're, if you're missing the law changing piece, then you're missing the whole point of it. Because you can't make change that is sustaining unless you're changing the laws, especially when you're talking about the way the system legally is set up. Um, and so for us, a lot of the... Okay, we're back. Uh, so for us, you know, even thinking, about, thinking back to the, the 1963 March on Washington, we were talking about it backstage, and I think one of the things um, that people don't know enough about is that, you know, they were meeting with legislators right before the march. They almost actually missed the march, and, and these are the key um, organizers of the march, they al almost missed the march because they were meeting with legislators, because they recognized that it wasn't just about bringing 250,000 people to the mall, that they needed to have that legislative piece to go with it. Um, they also met with the president after the march. So, for us, you know, thinking about how do we really create change, it has to be a work in tandem. It can't be either or, it has to be both end. I think Janae is actually absolutely right. I just wanted to follow up on that point quickly. One of the biggest concerns I had with respect to Black Lives Matter as a movement was I didn't want to see that energy turn into a Occupy Wall Street.
because one of the issues that I had and one of the concerns that I had was, okay, I'm with y'all, we're here together, we're on the same page, but where is the ask? What is the ask? Is there an ask? And I think that over time, the ask was developed. Um, you're, seeing a, you're seeing it a lot more. You can find the ask if you look for it. But I think that the average person who may be on Twitter seeing Black Lives Matter may not necessarily be familiar with that. And I think that's a very dangerous place to be. Let, let me just stop right there. DeRay, I need you to respond to that. No. Uh, uh, but I am going to finish, though. Oh, okay. I am going to yeah, finish, because there is an ask. Over, that's fine. The, the, no, no, no. The, 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 there is, there is no. an ask. There, yeah. I, I want to be clear, and I think that on a lot of levels, the movement has sort of caught a bad rap for people being unaware of the ask. I think that there has to be a, big, a bigger push so that people are clear about what it is. In the ideal world, I would love to see... Black Lives Matter evolve into the left's version mm. of the Tea Party in the sense that it has, a, it has a specific agenda that is very clear, that is separate and apart from everything that we're hearing now, that sort of middle of the road, and specifically, it places what we've already been hearing in a much tighter position, meaning that it places the Democratic Party and the Republican Party in a really tough position because it has an agenda that's separate than, from what we're hearing now. That's what I would love to see things evolve into, but that requires sort of a, a willingness and an acceptance that we are going to have to participate in this formal system and be a part of this process. Yeah, so I'll just say briefly, so I struggle with both of these narratives. I think that what is, uh, what is important to remember is that th the movement started without a, or without a SNCC, a SCLC, a Martin, a Malcolm, a Ella. It was people who came outside and were like, no more, right? And, and that origin matters in terms of like how the rest of the movement has played out. Remember a year ago, people thought that Ferguson had a problem. They didn't think America had a problem with policing. So it was literally a year of like exposing police violence to people, black and white and then convincing them that there was a crisis. And like, we just didn't know when everybody would be woke, right? It took, it was like, Walter Scott was a big moment across the country for people waking up, and then Freddie Gray was sort of like one of the last killings where people were like, okay, there's a problem. But we didn't, you know, we had, the protests at the beginning were about creating the crisis for people to say like, believe us, right? Like the pain is much closer to you than you think. Um, and I think the next part of the work is trying to figure out how we, like what does winning look like? But again, in this moment, so I, I accept this idea that like, I think the protests did a phenomenal job of creating the crisis. I think that the language around what does winning look like is, you know, needs to come. Um, but there is this thing in the movement space that I think we're struggling with that is like, the strategies that we use to expose and convince will not be the ones that we use to win, right? That there's a moment where like, the strategy has to change and some of the people will also change. And I think that in, I think in this space, people are feeling displaced a little bit about like, there are a lot of people who were pivotal to creating the crisis in streets and wherever else we protested, who don't necessarily know where they fit when we talk about sort of other types of wins. I do think some of it will be policy-based. I also think a lot of this is hearts and minds. Like at the core of this is this idea that the safety of communities is not predicated on the presence of police, right? That safety is a much more expansive notion. Um, and the police would have you believe that like to be safe requires tons of police, especially for black people. Um, and that just isn't true, right? The safety is like strong schools, it's access to healthcare, it's jobs, it's like safety means more. And like, I, I, I don't think the movement space has figured out how to uh, pack, because a lot of this is packaging, right? Black Lives Matter was packaging and the way that black power was packaging and Hands Up Don't Shoot was packaging and, I, and we are working to figure out how to package the win in ways that like, people can get and go into the streets around. Just very quickly, because I want to get, uh, get Dion, who's eager to say something, but when you say we are working on packaging and we are working on strategies, when you say we, who is it? Good, complicated question. So, you know, there is an organization called Black Lives Matter, and, and, and that is, that exists, and it existed before Ferguson happened. Um, and then there are, a lot of, there are a lot of protesters around the country who 
um, who organized, right? Who came out in the streets because of the unrest in Ferguson and have continued to organize. And there's no like one official organization that makes the movement. Um, when I say we, I talk about like a broad group of protesters that I, that I know across the country um, because, because I've, I've been protesting for a year. Um, and people that we bounce ideas off of, but I, but I also talk about it sort of more broadly. That there's so many people that though our tactics might uh, not always be in alignment, the goal is the same, right? That we're trying, that all of us are trying to get to the win. And in this moment, we're trying to flesh out what the win looks like in a way that can also mobilize people. Because the reality is, a lot of the solutions, like we're not making it up, right? I'm not. I don't need to do 10 years worth of research to be like the police union contract should be fair, right? Like we just need to figure out how to package it for people in ways that like can mobilize the people who are willing to keep creating the crisis. Dion? Yeah, yeah um, I, I just want to respond because well, uh, both DeRay and, and Janae said something that I, two things I thought were really interesting. Um, hearkening back to the march on Washington, because I think a, there's been a lot of criticism of the movement that he's been involved in and, and the modern day protest movement in terms of why don't you look like them. But, what, what people seem to think of when they think of the March on Washington is Martin Luther King got together a bunch of people and then 250,000 people showed up and it was great and they held hands. And what really happened was the March on Washington was a collection of a bunch of movements. And I spoke with uh, C.T. Vivian and Bernard Lafayette and, and some of the other you know, people who constructed that movement for an article I wrote uh, for the Atlanta Daily World a few years back commemorating the march. And it wasn't Martin Luther King got a bunch of people together. It was these very disparate organizations. It was SCLC, it was, uh, it was labor unions, it was SNCC, it was, you know, all these very disparate organizations. And it almost didn't come together at the last minute because they were arguing over various details. And that's one of the things that, you know, it, it happened then and it, it happens now, but that gets glossed over. What the movement that DeRay is a part of and that he's leading is, is one piece of this puzzle. And, and you know, if, if you want to see the sort of left equivalent of, or of, of the Tea Party movement, then you should go start that or, or someone else go start that. That's what I always tell people when they talk about why aren't they doing this? Like this man's doing his thing and he's, he's you know, had a lot of success doing his thing. If you want to see that, you should create that. And I don't just mean you specifically, Charles. I mean, in general, when I talk to people, it's like, well, why don't you go do it? Why don't you create this left movement of, of the Tea Party? Because I think that's a great idea and we need that, but that may not necessarily what we need, be what we need here. And, and when Janae is talking about the, you know, creating legislation and, you know, moving that within the movement, that's a, a great piece also, but I don't think that necessarily has to be tied into what's happening here, what's happening with Black Lives Matter, or what's happening with you know, any other movement. We can bring these things together for, to come to a common end or you know, to achieve a common goal. I, just, I don't think there is one way to go about this. And I think when we argue about the ways, we spend time talking rather than acting. And that in and of itself is a big problem. Let me, let me go to Orlando now. And um, this is not a setup because this was in the news today. <laughs> uh, Hillary Clinton uh, was confronted yesterday uh, with a, a, an activist from one of the Black Lives Matter organizations complaining about some of the things that had happened in the past, uh, some of the things that her husband as president has supported, and some of the positions she's taken. And she listened, and then she said, her response was, let's have a reckoning and that even for us sinners, we need to find some common brown, ground, having a positive vision, uh, a vision and plan. Is, is that something you think would resonate with Republicans as well? Well, in terms of uh, Hillary Clinton. You all are Cl not on the panel, okay. <laughs> uh, in terms of Hillary Clinton, I, I think that time and time again, she's shown us who she, who she really is. Uh, and, that, and that goes, Excuse me. That starts with her support of the tough on crime policies in the 90s that her husband enacted. And, and, that, and that, you know, that comes to 2008 when she basically compared President Obama to Martin Luther King and said that, yeah, MLK gave great speeches, but it took LBJ to pass legislation. So I think we know who Hillary Clinton is. And, 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 and I kind of want to get a little bit back to what everyone else on this panel had been talking about, just, to, just for a minute. Yeah, but I, uh, I just want you to respond to this notion 
of the need to have some common ground on an issue that everybody is pretty much agreed is one of our most challenging in the country. So that's what I want to do. And then yeah. you can respond the other, yeah. to the others. Certainly. So Wendell Berry is an author from Kentucky, and he has this really beautiful quote that I love. I'm just going to paraphrase it a little bit. But essentially he says that when people uh, speaking in good faith about that which they know and love, uh, you know, come together in the presence of those things, they often find that they, have, they share common ground. So essentially when we put aside all the partisan politics, when we, when we you know, get rid of the labels uh, and talk about, speak honestly and truthfully about the things that we know and care about, we, we find that we actually agree more than we disagree. Um, so, yes. Uh, but An issue you wanted to raise? Go ahead. I did. Um, I, I think what we, we've heard up here so far on this panel is a critique of protest ideology uh, from everyone so far. And uh, if not, at least an acknowledgement that protests are only one piece of the puzzle or step A, and there's got to be something else or something more to it if we truly want to transcend you know, or transform our current situation. Uh, so what does that take? What's the next step? And I think Charles is, you know, he, he's talked a little bit about his frustration with, well, I, I, I want to see that, you know, the, what's the next step in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement? And, and Janae is, you know, she said, well, we need to put pressure on our politicians and elected officials to pass policies that advance, you know, our lives or make our communities better. And I think that's true. I think the next step is organization and it's putting real pressure on real institutions to create the change that we want to see. But my issue would be, uh, my issue with, with it would be that I think sometimes millennials, since we're focused on millennials to frame it up a bit, uh, oftentimes lobby for others to do things for them rather than doing it for themselves. And, and what I mean by that, what, I mean, what, I mean, what I mean by that is rather than going out and building your own institution or turning inward within your community and saying we're going to take control of you know, our school system or our police department, we're asking others to do it for us. And that's outsourcing our agency. That's, that's, that's putting, you know, making, allowing others to make decisions for us. And so I think for me, that, that's something that, you know, it, it hurts me to see. And I think we should, you know, as citizens, uh, build amongst ourselves. Just, just quickly, when you say outsourcing our agency, who is our? Our, outsourcing our agency. Our. Yeah, our would be my community, the black community. Community. But it could be, I mean, because that's, what we're, that's who we're talking about now. Can you say that? Um, I, I, I'm kind of torn a little bit because I think in a lot, in, in some ways, um, Orlando, what we do see a lot of um, youth, specifically millennial population coming out and saying, we're going to do it for ourselves. Um, I think that's a big part of even what DeRay was talking about, um, because, to, you, you know, in, in talking about the movement and talking about the new movement, I would argue the movement had never stopped. Um, and in a lot of ways, my organization has been fighting for police, against police brutality since our founding 25 years ago. So this was an issue that we already knew was existing. I think what has happened, though, through the advent of social media and technology and Twitter is that you're able to see how it's not just one community. So I think in a, in a lot of ways, in the history of NAN beginning to where we are now, um, and a lot of new groups coming out, I do think you see a lot of millennials saying, we're not gonna rely on, we're not gonna outsource our agency. But if you're talking specifically about black people, I even think then you see, you see the same thing. I think in this moment right now, there is a lot of, of black people, there are a lot of black people saying, we're not gonna rely on anyone else to liberate us. We are for self-liberation and that is what we are about. So I, I, I don't agree with you. I think, you know, in a lot of ways, it's, it's quite the opposite. I'll just, uh, just a response to that. I think that the Black Lives Matter movement has begun to do exactly that, or at least they've had a microphone um, that's, that, that has, and I, I know you'll take <laughs> issue with it, it's being with the National Action Network. but. Uh, but no, the, the, the point being, it, it's that instead of, again, I'm sorry, instead of lobbying for others to do for us, I mean, we've lost a lot of our leverage and political power by being radically op opposed to ever voting or even considering voting for another party. And so that's why Black Lives Matter, the, that movement has put pressure on their allies, on Democrat allies, because yeah, they get 90 plus percent of the vote every election cycle, 
but where's their black agenda? Where's their plan? And so if you look at some of the successes of, of, of their tactics and strategies, uh, I mean, Bernie Sanders came out with his criminal justice reform plan. Hillary Clinton's now talking black, about black issues. Uh, they're no longer just pointing at Republicans and saying that they're the boogeyman, so vote for us. And I think that, that, that is a victory. Um, but we've got to hold our allies accountable. Uh, and, we, and, we, and we have to also consider the other side and give them a chance. And that's part of... Uh, of my job as well. Let's I just want to add one. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, let's okay. give Janae a chance. Yes, I just want to add one point because I think when we say Black Lives Matter as a movement, I think there's a there's a little bit of a of a challenge there, right? Because Black Lives Matter started out as a hashtag before it was a movement, and I think that hashtag is a sentiment that is shared by people who don't even realize that now it's now a movement or it's now an organization, I should say. So there are a lot of people who say Black Lives Matter. And it has nothing to do with the organization or, you know, it, it is more of the movement, but then there is the organization. So I think part of what we, we need to sort of parse out is the movement itself, which, I, you know, I don't know what you want to call it, but I think the sentiment in and of itself is, is valid. Um, I, I just wanted to make that clarification because I think a lot of times people get caught up in the, the Black Lives Matter as that's the movement. And it, I don't think that that's all encompassing of the movement. Uh, I, I <laughs> don't know. I, you, you know, I love you, Orlando. <laughs> it's like all I can say. I, 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 I shouldn't have to, you know, this idea of outsourcing is like so, I don't even, all I, I love you. Um, like, I shouldn't have to beg the police not to kill. Like, it's not, I'm not outsourcing anything to be like, the police shouldn't kill people, right? Or like, or like, institutions shouldn't harm people. That's not me, like, abdicating any responsibility of my own. That's me as a taxpayer being like, what is my money? My money shouldn't be paying for them bullets, right? Like, that, like that is a, I don't know. So I don't even, I'm trying to, I'm struggling through this, like, outsourcing thing. Because I don't, I think that there's so many people sort of pushing and saying, like, the system at the very least should do no harm, Right? And like that is like a that is like a bare minimum request. Um, so I so no. I, when people are in the streets or when people are protesting in boardrooms or are protesting at the, in the legislative space, like this idea that confrontation and disruption is the heart of protest. Like we protest differently, but I but I understand her as like a sister in protest, right? I didn't see her in the street with me, but she's protesting in a boardroom that I'm not in, and I and I respect that, right? But like I don't think people like outsource. That's like a that is that I don't understand that that like. I don't get it. <laughs> well, let, let him respond and then we'll come to you, Charles. Okay, I guess just to clarify, my, my point being when we talk, when I, when I talk about outsourcing agency, it's voting for those, it's voting for, for more government, increased government spending, uh, bigger government, centralized control, allowing others in a place far, far away from you, hundreds of miles away from where you live, people who don't necessarily understand your needs, your situation, your environment, making decisions for you. And so I think the, the, the closer that those decisions are made to the people, the more representation we actually have and the more political power we have and, 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 and the better we can change our own circumstances. So I, I'm equating outsourcing agency with increasing government's interference in our lives. Charles? <laughs> Sure your mic is on. Is my mic one. on? Okay. Orlando, I'm really trying to let you live, brother. I'm really, <laughs> I'm really trying to let you live. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I understand ideologically where you're coming from. It, it is a very Republican-based um, ideology. Um, it's consistent. But I can be honest with you, as I sit here, with respect to what you're talking about, I don't know that... Ben Carson, Mike Huckabee, Donald Trump, or any of those people understand my situation, understand my needs, or are willing to address them. So, whereas your criticisms of the Democratic Party's shortcomings are indeed valid and warranted, and I can support you on that. I can rock with you on that all day long. I don't know, and this is part of the issue that I think many of my friends and I have, I don't know that there has been a viable alternative in 
the name of the Republican Party that has yet to be presented. Now, going to your, going back to your original sort of sentiment about this notion of like us doing it ourselves and, you know, just, it, it sounds reminiscent of pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And it, it, it sounds reminiscent of that, even if that's not where you're going. But the point that I want to make is that works when the playing field is level. When the playing field is not, that is a problem. And at the end of the day, I think one important piece that I have to add as a caveat to what you said is that there is a, an important notion, and Janae touched on this, of accountability. Because you're talking about us fixing for ourselves things that we, in fact, did not break ourselves. So, when, so there is this element of accountability that we cannot lose or let go of because at the end of the day, even if we decide to go into our own communities and do it ourselves, if we are not holding those accountable for what they have done, then we are essentially co-signing on that behavior. Oh, go ahead. I've got to respond to that. Uh, Charles, so I, 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 hear, I hear your point. You don't feel as if your interests are reflected on the other side, but I don't even think that this debate should be liberal versus conservative, Democrat versus Republican. I mean, we're talking about the advancement of black people in this country. And where do we have a blueprint of oppressed groups who have done well for themselves in the past? I would say after the Civil War, Reconstruction. And so when you say that you don't have necessarily uh, you know, ideas of institutions that, that, that we've built for ourselves, I would say, what about the HBCUs? What about historically black colleges and universities? What about our civic organizations like the Urban League and the NAACPs and NAN? What about ch the church, the black church, an institution that helped our people get ahead in hostile and discriminatory times? So I think we can do for ourselves. I think that sometimes when faced in a hostile environment, oppressed groups have turned inward to build and create solidarity amongst, them, uh, amongst one another and seek solutions that, that advance all of us. And so I, I do believe that you know, we all agree that we're committed uh, to, event, you know, to improving black people's lives, uh, and we might just disagree a little bit about how we get there, but there certainly are historical examples of us doing for ourselves. Okay, Janae? So just really quickly, because you, you sort of opened the door right before you closed it, um, and so I'm just gonna like stick my toe in and, and just say, when we talk about smaller government um, versus larger government, yeah. sure. What I think of, um, when I think of smaller government, I think of ALEC, I think of stand your ground laws, I think of voter ID laws, I think of policing policies like stop and frisk and broken windows. So that's what I think of when I think of smaller government. And that has been done by people in your party. I'm just saying. I like you, I love you, we've had lots of great conversation, but when we start going down that road of oh, well, we can do it for ourselves. Well, this is what they think we need. They think we need voter ID when we've never had it before, and some of us can't get it as easily as they would like to make you think they can. Stand your ground laws. They want to make us think that, that we're allowed to, to protect ourselves in our own domain, and if we feel threatened. But when you see these cases, we are the ones that die more than anyone else. So, I mean, I'm just saying, when, we, when we're talking about this, let's be real about what smaller and local government has given us versus federal. Okay. Uh, we, we may come back to this, but I'm, <laughs> and I'm sure somebody out there is chomping at the bit to do that, but let me, let me just slightly change the subject for a moment. Uh, Dion, earlier, you talked about the conflicts at the March on Washington, uh, and we all know that John Lewis got put back in his place because they didn't want him to be so militant, but you know, he made up with everybody. But this is what I want to know. I've heard protesters today say that the civil rights movement of yesterday is of no relevance to them today. And my question is, do you agree with that and, and if you do, say why, and if not, say why, uh, and tell me what lessons there might be. Uh, Dion, why don't you start with okay. that? Um, <laughs> ooh, 
All right. So yeah, I do. Um, I've heard that, and I think there there's sort of again two sides to that because I think the lessons of yesteryear are absolutely important because I think in a lot of ways we've fallen behind where we were. But at the same time, you know, when you had leaders, like I was talking to a friend of mine and I was saying, currently, you know, looking at the movement right now, we have no Martin, we have no Malcolm. And my friend Anif reminded me, well, Martin and Malcolm both got shot. So if you're trying to bring what Martin and Malcolm brought, you know, it's like, well, the system's already got something for that. You know, it's like if you're in the system like, oh, well, let's go back to 1965. How we solve that problem? Oh, yeah. So I think there... There is absolutely a need to understand how we got what we got in the past in terms of, I think one of the, one of the big misunderstandings that people have is looking at the sit-ins. And this is one thing that I, I learned from speaking with uh, C.T. Vivian. The sit-ins were much more an economic protest than a protest against the law because if you have a bunch of people in your restaurant and you refuse to serve them, they're taking the place of people who you would serve. Therefore, your restaurant doesn't make any money. And I think I see a lack of an economic element to a lot of the protesting that's going on today. And I think that comes from a lack of understanding of the economics of the protest of that day. Um, I think it also just stems from a general lack of a lot of financial literacy on, on, our, on our part. And so I think that has to be a part of it in terms of learning things that weren't necessarily um, a salient part of those old protests. I think we want to do something that hadn't been done, so we have to do something that, we, we want to achieve something we've never had, so we have to do something that we've never done. And so I think in that respect, the, the old protests and the, the protests from the days of old do need to sort of be put in a book somewhere, but we also need to read that book and then take it to the next level and write our own. So I think that's what, what's important. Thank you. What do you think about that, Dwayne? I mean, are there you think from the civil rights movement that can be applicable because um, what, what Dion just said reminds me once again of my good friend Julian who learned from Ella Baker, one of the mentors of the movement, that it was about more than a hamburger. And that's when they began to go out and organize. So despite the conflicts, and we many of us are old enough to remember that there were conflicts among the movement, but their ultimate goals were the same. In those days, it was to get rid of segregation and separate but equal and to get black people voting. I mean, they had, and, and no matter what their various approaches were, the NAACP was in the courts and the SNCC with the shock troops and the others were doing other things. So, you know, when you look back, do you agree that this movement had no relevance, has no relevance to today, or are there lessons that are applicable to what you're doing? Yeah, I, you know, I would never say it, it is irrelevant. I remember this conversation I had with Diane Nash and Selma, um, and we spent like a morning together. And at the end of it, she said, do it your way. She was like, if I had listened to everybody who had told me what to do when we were organizing the rides, we never would have got on the bus. Like, no, she was like, we never would have started. Um, <laughs> And I appreciated that, right? Like, I think what is real for us is that, like, I have never seen resistance before. So it is not that I'm, like, dismissing the resistance of, of yesteryear, but, like, I saw Occupy, and I haven't seen, I didn't see a Freedom Ride, I have never seen a sit-in, like, I, like, we, I didn't see it, right? And there's something about, like, remembering resistance um, that is really powerful, but there's something different about seeing it. I think about the protests that are spread across the country, they saw it, right? They could call us from Ferguson or we could go and visit. Like, there's something about that. So I don't think we're dismissing it, but I do think, again, we didn't discover injustice and we didn't create resistance, right? We didn't make up protests, we know that. Um, there is, I, I really struggle with this language of like, you know, the, if only the protesters boycotted and there was an economic thing. Like, it's this idea, like, as somebody who, and I, you know, I'm one of many people, so not, I'm not the leader of the movement, I didn't start it, can't stop it. Um, <laughs> there are so many of us who put out, you know, I think about like hiding under my steering wheel because the SWAT, the SWAT car was coming down, or like people in St. Louis got tear gassed just last night. Is that like, that means something as important as a boycott when I think about it, right? That like there was something about people putting their bodies on the line that created this crisis that even makes space for all of you to be in a church talking about this today. Um, and like, there's this weird, I take it as just like blaming people for not being perfect resistors, right? Like that's like a weird thing to me. Um, so I always have this visceral reaction when people are like, well, if only the protesters did this, and it is often, and I say this in love, it is often people who did not stand with us in streets, right? So, so there's this, so I struggle with that um, in love. I, I think that, 
Yeah, and like I also know that like this is part one, right? That part of it is creating the crisis, that protest is space making, right? That protest opens up space for us to do other stuff. Let, let, let me follow up and then I'm gonna ask maybe two more questions and I'll go to the audience. So those of you who have questions, start organizing them. Um, some of the protesters in Ferguson were chanting, we're ready for what? We're ready for war. And I, I wanna know what does that forebode? I don't remember that. I know a lot of the chants. I've never heard that one, but. No, I heard it. Um, <laughs> and I say that like seriously, not like I can't talk about that in public. Like well, I really have haven't. said that it's a diverse movement, but there is, there, that did exist. Yeah. No, I think the people, I mean, the police have killed somebody every day this year but nine days in every state but three and have killed over 720 right so there's this thing about like the crisis is so real that it feels like where you think about st louis the police have killed nine people since august a, a paralyzed one and two are in critical condition so it's like you know the cry it feels like war especially when you're out there like i don't you know i remember when i was just back there you know there were gunshots and we were like you know it's gunshots nobody runs because we've heard guns before but then we heard the bullets whiz by us and we're like if you hear a whiz that means a bullet's close to you <laughs> so you know there's this moment of like it feels like you're in the middle of of this war right and like i think about the protesters last night just in st louis the police killed somebody um, and you know, it's the middle of the day, they're shooting tear gas, smoke bombs, they got new tear gas, because we, we now like, can feel the difference, which is wild. Um, and there, there's something about that. You know, I'm getting texts where people are like, I'm protesting the tear gas, I refuse to bring a mask today. And there is something about like, that is wild that we know like the types of masks, like what clothes not to wear, because tear gas sticks to your clothes, right? That's like a wild thing to do. I'm, I'm just wondering, because I just saw, and I think the documentary maker is in here, Abby, Ginsburg, uh, a documentary she's working on about the origins of the Black Studies movement. Mm. And it went from San Francisco State all the way to Cornell. And at Cornell, what really ended it was the black students, well, there was a cross burned on their lawn, and then the black students took up weapons, guns. And you just wonder, is history about to repeat itself? What, what is your view on that, uh, Charles? I'm really glad you came to me on that. <laughs> no, I, I am. Um, I think the fundamental question that rests within each of us, and I, I have this conversation often, and I don't want to sound too radical, but the question that each of us has to ask is, what are we willing to sacrifice? What are we willing to sacrifice for what freedom means? for what real freedom means. The Birmingham bus, bus, bus boycotts lasted for over a year. I know people who wouldn't, who can't turn scandal off. No, sh no shade, no shade to Shonda, to, to, to Kerry, to anybody getting work, no shade. I, I say it because our focus we have to understand that, you know, we've, t we've had this conversation. There's this really, internally, there's this really difficult conversation that we have. And DeRay, uh, and, and DeRay touched on a little bit with respect to, like, respectability politics versus us just going for hours. That's internally what sort of the, 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 the rift is. And, and, and a lot of that is characterized or classified by, beyond or behind the old guard versus the new guard, so to speak, like the respectability brigade that are like, oh, if you guys just chill out, don't stop, stop burning things. Um, there's that versus like, you know what, now nah, we're going for hours and we're not leaving here until we get it. So there's, there's that like interesting thing. But I think as a whole, we have to internally, individually decide for ourselves, what are we willing to sacrifice? Is it the loss of life? Is it something as simple as I'm going to take two hours every week to mentor a kid? I mean, something, you know, it, it can be big or small. But as Frederick Douglass once said, there must be a struggle. A struggle may be moral or maybe physical. But at the end of the day, that demand that he talked about in that writing is a demand that we have to be prepared to make and that we have to be prepared to sacrifice to see it fulfilled. Thank you, thank you. Can I, can I, I, I just, just jump in? I, I just want to uh, quickly go to one other 
turn in the road, and then you can come back to whatever you want to talk about in a few minutes. But, and I do, again, want to give the audience, but I, I got to ask you this question. President Obama recently began speaking out more forcefully on race. And one young millennial professor, actually, I'm not sure how old he was, but he sounded young, <laughs> uh, praised him for that. But he also said it was too little, too late. So I want each of you just very briefly to tell me how do you see the president on the issue of race and what his legacy will be? Let me start with Janine. Um, well, you know, I think it's an interesting place in history to be, right? We are coming up on the end of the first ever black president. And I think, um, I think when, when President Obama won, the, there was an expectation by black people that in a lot of ways was unrealistic. Um, we expected him to solve all of our problems in four years, maybe eight, that were created in 400. That's impossible. <laughs> um, I will say that I think the president has done a good job, and that's, that's my opinion. I think he's done a, a good job in stepping out on these issues. Yeah, I'll end there. <laughs> Yeah, so I think that his I think that his rhetoric around race has gotten much stronger as the second term ends. I'm hopeful that it will continue to get strong. Uh, I was surprised that he talked about solitary confinement in one of those last speeches. Um, I will leave it at that. Every time I talk about him, it always you know causes a storm on Twitter. So that is it. Um, I, I think it's good that he's talking about it now. It, it kind of reminds me of um, after Bill Clinton left office, he said in an interview, uh, I think marijuana should be legal. And I remember some comedian said, boy, it sure would have been nice if you were in a position where you could have done something about that. <laughs> and so it's just, I don't know, a lot of it just, it's like, hey, that's cool that you're talking about it. Why don't you, you know, reform some laws? Why don't you release more than 42 nonviolent marijuana offenders from prison? Why don't you, you know, do some of these things that are within your control to do? But I really think the best, thing, the best thing to come out of Barack Obama's presidency is this realization that we've come to recently that the president can't solve all our problems, that one man can't do all these things that we need done, that we need to take some self-agency and do it and take to the streets and really make ourselves heard that way. So you don't think that it was too little, too late, what he had to say? I, I think it was about what it is, you know, it was, it was whatever. Ooh, like, thanks, Barack. <laughs> Orlando? Uh, so the question was, how do we see President Barack Obama on race? Uh, well, I think, I think his election... <laughs> Get I, know. I, I think that the president's election was historic and it's, and it's done a lot for this country. Uh, but I also strongly and firmly believe that uh, his recent rhetoric hasn't matched the reality uh, the realities, uh, people are disaffected, disillusioned, and disappointed. Uh, you can look at black businesses who, under President, President Bush, uh, received 8% of small business loans, SBA loans, and now that, that number is under 2%. So what are we doing for, for black business? Uh, if you look at HBCUs, our historically black colleges and universities, they, their funding was cut. Their funding was cut under the president, and Pell Grants, the formula that determines how much money a student gets to go to college, was changed not allowing enough young black students to afford an education the next semester. Um, and on criminal justice reform, and I'll, I'll just end with this. Oh. Sorry, but you're to have speak, but not while he's speaking, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, I'll, and I'll just say, I'll finish with this on issues like criminal justice reform. It's Republicans who have given uh, Democrats uh, some cover and the ability to talk about it probably the way that they wanted to talk about it for some time now. But uh, senators like Mike Lee, uh, Rand Paul, uh, and others have been leading on these issues uh, to reform mandatory minimums. And it, it's actually a shame that, that some Democrat senators like Chuck Schumer or Debbie Washerman Schultz, who's the head of the DNC, are to the right of Republicans on ending mandatory minimums. Thank you. Charles. Remember I'm not what gonna, the I'm, question right, was? Right, no, no, no. Re, absolutely. No, I'm not going to sit up here and diss Barrio. I rock with Barrio. Um, I, 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 I do think 
particularly because as a former prosecutor, issues of criminal justice and the criminal justice system are very near and dear to my heart. I do honestly feel like it was too little too late. I wanted to hear that earlier from him. I wanted to hear policy earlier from him to address these things. In a lot of ways, you know, I've been critical of the president, but I understand his job is incredibly difficult, particularly because even from our community, there are so many different just elements pulling at him. But at the same time, when you ask the question about how will he, what will be his, reg his legacy with respect to race, honestly, I don't know. I look at the president and I look at his legacy with respect to race, and some of it is an enigma. We have an incredible historic campaign speech by Barry O, the politician in Philadelphia when he's running the first time. And then we go from that to like, and, and people may have felt differently about it, but then we go to like beer on the White House lawn, right? And a teachable moment when, you know, part of my French, we were pissed that you had that encounter. And we wanted a reaction from the president that was not, let's sit down and have a beer and talk. We were pissed. And then you go from that to like in the wake of Trayvon Martin and the George Zimmerman acquittal, this incredible speech in the middle of the day that nobody expected where he just killed it, right? And now we're going to criminal justice reform. So it's like these, the presidency with respect to race, it, it's been a series of highs and lows and so I don't know how history will ultimately view that. I'm hoping positively. Okay, finally on my part, um, I keep saying that, but I just, you, you guys are so amazing and I love hearing you talk about things. So I wanna ask you, um, uh, we, we, we hear a lot of conversation about race these days, more than in any time I can remember. It's, in fact, it's a cacophony because everybody's talking about it. It's coming and it's going and it's over here and it's over there. So what I want to talk to you about just very briefly before we go to the audience, we, we hear the discussion about race, but it's about what's bad. We rarely hear about solutions. And in that regard, I'm pumping my own upcoming series on PBS on solutions. <laughs> but I want to know. <laughs> Well, hey, I don't get paid doing this, so I might as well <laughs> make some hay somehow. Tell me if any of you have, and I heard this actually on NPR this morning, so I'm stealing it. What is your solution for narrowing the racial divide, and do you have any suggestions for people who are interested in doing that? I heard on, um, on uh, it was uh, the takeaway this morning, uh, Malcolm Graham out of uh, Charleston talking about two books and I was driving and I wasn't supposed to be using the phone so I couldn't write down the name of the books but I'm gonna go and find them. But he had two books that he thought people should read who were interested in solving or, or helping move us toward better solutions. So very quickly, and then I really am coming out there, what is your solution and what are you recommending people for people that want to help narrow the racial divide? Wow, oh, that's a big question. Um, a solution, a solution. Um, I, I think part of how we address, and I don't know that this solves it, because um, I, I think if I could solve racism, it would have been solved by now. Um, part of it is, is really having the conversation, um, having conversations like these, having difficult conversations, having protest moments where people are, are required to, you know, ask themselves and confront the realities of different situations. I think um, that's the first step because if we continue to act like racism does not exist, um, then we're not going to make any progress in erasing it. Um, so ultimately, I think that that's it. And I, in terms of how we can do that, I think it is about listening more. I, there's not necessarily a resource. I think sometimes we get so um, passionate about our own feelings and thoughts and this is what we believe and you know, you can't tell me this is racism and you can't say that, that it's not. And we're, we're standing on opposite sides and we're not listening to one another. So I would say, listen. Thank you. 
Yeah, I think that I don't have anything deep to say about race writ large, but about policing, I think that um, so much of this is trying to explain complex, complex wins simply. Like this idea that it won't, you know, one of our critiques of the civil rights movement is that it was, and this is a loving critique, is that it was focused on like a couple, a couple wins um, with, which gave people much more access to still racist systems, right? And this idea that like if we can figure out how to get people to understand like body cameras in concert with independent investigations and in concert with fair, fair police union contract, like if we can wrap that up in a way that makes sense, like we think that that will be leverage. We're working on something now called Campaign Zero, like we can live in a world where the police don't kill people, um, which hopefully will come out soon. This idea that we can build structures and systems that get us to zero and like sustain zero, which we hope will be one way to do it. But I think so much of the solution work at this point is like packaging will be my offering. Um, this seems like a good time actually to kind of come back to what I was saying because it relates to the answer to this question. So when DeRay was talking about, uh, you know, why is it important to bring the economic or, or financial impact? And to me the answer to that is because this is America and America is about money. Uh, this is a capitalist system very much by design and was formed that way. There's a reason only people who owned property were able to vote when they started the country. There's a reason why you know, those people control so much more of the things that happen now because America is about money. And if you live in America, you have to understand that and you have to understand how the money works. And so getting back to how do you solve racism in a sense or how do we solve these racial problems, one of the biggest steps is I think helping more black folks get money and get out of the, the pover, poverty stricken situations that a lot of us are in. A lot of our communities, you know, it's like, well, where's the crime? The crime's where all the black people are. Well, no, the crime is where all the poor people are. And a lot of the poor people, you know, a lot of the poor people happen to be black. And so, you know, we, we can't just through our own agency solve that problem. A lot of that has to come from, you know, mandates from the government to hire black people, uh, to accept black people to college. Because again, you know, we're, we're talking at my job about why are there no black people in Silicon Valley? It's because no people at Silicon Valley know any black people. So you hire the people you know and they don't know any black people. So it's, it's as simple as putting us in position and then taking advantage of those opportunities. But, you know, like we were saying with the police, I haven't seen the police shoot one rich person. I haven't seen the cops pull anybody out of a Bentley and beat them down with their nightsticks. Rich, these things happen to poor people because poor people lack agency. And it's important, I think, to give back agency to poor people, but in terms of solving these problems, the answers to a lot of these are, are financial understanding and, and gaining prosperity for all of us and helping all of us to be more successful. Um, you know, it's, it's like when, when Martin got shot, Martin didn't get shot when he was protesting segregation or when he was opposing, you know, uh, uh, separate, sorry, I'll, I'll wrap it up, separate restrooms. He got shot when he was at a worker, sanitation worker strike in Memphis because he was protesting the money. That's why I say it's all about the money, because we live in America and America's about money. Uh, <clears throat> solutions, in terms of whenever we discuss strategy or tactics, uh, I think it's important that we, we wrap our heads around you know, what's achievable given our current circumstances. And so the tactics and strategies that, that are winnable and achievable today, or, or that we can employ today, may not have worked 50 years ago. And, and you know, the protests you know, marching down, down the street may not have worked 50 years before that. So I think we really need to understand the circumstances that we live in and to develop, better develop strategies and tactics for moving forward. But with that being said, I mean, black people are a political, a cultural, a, a social, and an economic force in this country. $1.1 trillion in purchasing power. Uh, the CBC, the Congressional Black Caucus, has 46 members. It's, it's the largest Congressional Black Caucus in its history. Uh, I mean, we have more black college graduates today than we did in 1990, uh, almost double. So I just challenge everyone here to every day, you know, challenge systems that stifle opportunity uh, in whatever way that you can. Uh, work toward democratizing access for, for others. And, and, and I mean, if you see a barrier to entry for a particular industry, maybe it's one that you work in, try to knock it down. Uh, but lastly, reconsider who it is politically who's talking about uh, break, uh, busting down the doors to barriers to entry if, if it's the taxi cab industry and, and, and one side lines up on the side of the union and the other side says no, we're on the side of the driver and, and, the, and, the, and the passenger. Or if it's, uh, 
or if you're talking about expanding access to a quality education and saying you have the choice or you should be able to you know, decide where your child goes to school. Challenge the, the broken public school system. Uh, and, if, and if you look at that, I think you'll see that you know, the GOP should be given a, a chance. Thank you. Yo, man, you are consistent, brother. You, you are like that old Negro spiritual. Ain't nobody gonna turn you around. <laughs> I hear that. I hear that. I hear that. Charlene, to answer your question. Thank you. Um, as Janae already pointed out, the question of race in America is something that has existed since America. Um, and so, you know, it, it is probably, it's very probable that we won't be able to, you know, draw up a solution here and now. If I had anything to suggest, it would be, first of all, and, and DeRay touched on this earlier, with respect to my white friends, understand and accept and acknowledge that the, the fact is that many of you all carry with you a privilege. White privilege is real, it's okay, it exists, it's a thing. But rather than be hell bent on denying that, be willing to leverage that privilege to the benefit of others. If there's anything that you can do to address the conversation of race, it's that and it's coming to the conversation, I forget who said this, with an understanding that, you know what? I may not get this whole thing. I may not understand it entirely. I may have some blinders on and be willing to have those conversations even as they're uncomfortable, even as they're a little awkward, and even as they're difficult. That's what I would suggest to my black friends. Many of us exist in spaces each and every day where we aren't necessarily always in those areas that Dion described. We have nice, we're on the vineyard, so let's keep it way 100, all right? We drive nice cars, we live in nice buildings, we have decent jobs, some of us are mid-management level, feeling ourselves just a little bit. What I think oftentimes happens is that when a Freddie Gray is killed, when a Michael Brown is killed, when a Trayvon Martin is killed, we know that we feel that. When an Eric Garner is killed, we know that we feel that. When a 14-year-old when a girl is brutalized in McKinney, Texas on camera, we know we feel that. But in a lot of ways, many of the others who we encounter each and every day, they don't necessarily get that. They don't necessarily understand we as a community are connected to that. It impacts us, it's traumatic for us. This is an issue, despite the fact that it may not exist in this office per se, and, and even then I would be willing to argue with you that perhaps it does, it's an issue. And so I think helping them to understand the connection that we feel as a community as to why we're affected and the fact that we are affected can go a long way into advancing the conversation. Thank you. Now, um, thank you very much, all of you. Um, and I'll have a final question once the audience gets their opportunity. We've got microphones on each side of the aisle, and uh, I'm going to ask you uh, to be very, very brief in your questions because we, it's my fault, but we only have 20 minutes left. And, uh, oh, we got a lot of people with questions. So <laughs> let's just be very, very brief in the questions and we'll decide who answers them. The lady in the yellow dress was first in line. Would you start your question, please? Yes. So I really want to say that I greatly respect the work of Black Lives Matter in uh, 
capturing the national attention for something that's been a terrible problem in the black community in terms of uh, police brutality. But my son is a millennial, and when we talk about the work of Black Lives Matter with him, he says to me, but the people who are really killing black men in the streets is other young black men. I understand that crime is where poverty is, but as the famous sociologist Orlando Patterson likes to say, they're not the same levels of violence in India where poverty is much more extreme. So my question is, what would you young people say to this question of black men killing other young black men? And secondly, why do you think no one brought it up in all of the discussion we've had over the last hour and a half? Thank you. Uh, D-Ray, oh, who wants to, I mean. Okay. Go, go for it, go for it. I think that what the question itself, I think hits the nail on the head with respect to the, what I talked about a little bit earlier, like this, this rift between respectability politics or the notion of respectability politics versus where the new generation is coming from. I think that no one is saying and no, nor has anyone ever said or articulated that we're okay with crime in our community. I don't think that that's, that's ever been the message. And, and I think part of the unfortunate aspect of why uh, 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 or of the way that Black Lives Matter has been able to get so much attention sort of shines a very twisted light on the notion of black on, the, the misnomer, let me be clear, or black on black violence. But we're talking about a different situation when you have government employed people who are shooting innocent people in the street when those people are sworn to protect and serve us. That is a different conversation and it's not necessarily that we're okay with one and not okay with the other. We're highlighting the fact that there are innocent black men being killed by people who literally are paid to serve and protect us. It's two separate conversations. I, I do think, maybe not tonight, but we really do need to have that conversation about what our own responsibility is within no our own community. No we, we, we can't go there tonight. Uh, ben, I'll get you one second. Let me get this. Uh, who is that over there? I can't see. I'm, I got a black dog shirt. I'm okay. black and white. No, no worries. All right. So. And make our questions brief. We've got a limited amount of time now. So very quickly, one thank you panel for wonderful conversation today. I'm interested to know what is the long-term plan? See, to me, it seems like strategy is tied to a long-term gain. And we talked about incidents, and I agree finances should be part of it. But I'd be really interested to hear if we're talking about they rock, but can they rule? In terms of having a rule, we need to know what the strategy is going to be and what's the long-term strategy. Not just today, we need a 20-year, 30-year plan. And where does that exist, or does it exist, or are we thinking about it? Uh, who wants to take that? I mean, I, I don't think there's one singular answer. You're going to get different answers from all of us. But obviously, I mean, you know, in terms of um, what is the plan, the plan is to ensure a, a better America where black people are treated as equal and we have freedom, as Charles talked about. I think that would, that would be, I mean, I know it's like, it's a pithy answer for a very complex question and, and, and a question that you would get different answers from all of us. So we can talk afterwards. DeRay, do you have an answer to that? All I can say is I think the entrance, when I think about the movement space, is like police violence. I think that one of the things that is real is that we don't know what winning feels like. And I think there's something about like feeling a win, taking that model, and then expanding that. And the same way that the protests, right? It was like people shut down some stuff at the beginning, created a model for resistance that we could see, and then that spread. So I think that in the beginning, if I had to think about wins, it would be like some wins on police violence that I think will then expand to the other things that we know to be important, like education, mass incarceration, those things. I think that you answer, you ask an important question about like what does it look like over an arc and I don't know yet like I think that again people haven't yet seen any type of win that is real I just want to make sure that it is it's part of the conversation because we have to think about nation building in the long-term play because the short-term play a couple of wins wonderful but we should also have the metrics and where we want to be I think you made your point thank you 30 years is, is, is a short amount of time I'm gonna say that in terms of the movement it's a very short amount of time so if you want a real answer you know you got to think broader yes, uh, this is, uh, 
Ben Jealous, uh, former head of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Thank you. Well, this is fun, I gotta tell you. You know, I've been getting used to being the nation's youngest retired civil rights leader. <laughs> And I felt like it today. And it was fun to watch this panel. I want to thank all of you for your voices over the past year, especially. It's important. As Skip talked about at the beginning, we're also mourning Julian this week. And as black people and as people who believe, people of all races who believe in inclusion, we really don't know what inclusive politics in this country looks like without Julian Bond in it. Because he was there from right after the passage of the VRA in politics all the way active through last week. And so I was thinking about what question would he ask somebody on this panel, and Brother Watson, I, I have a question for you. And first I want to say that I appreciate your being here. I appreciate, please. I appreciate your spirit. I also appreciate that you currently work for the chairman of the RNC, and that therefore, and I have been a spokesperson. And that therefore, you are allowed to say a lot of what you think, but maybe not all of what you think. And I look forward to that point in your career, albeit inside the GOP, where maybe one day you can say all of what you think, because that, I think, will help all of us. In your current role, however, as a spokesperson for the RNC, I want to ask you this question. The challenge for today's Republicans is to prove that they are not yesterday's bad Democrats that they are not just simply rehashed Dixiecrats. The, the RNC's chairman has also been, has at different times ultimately been a seawall for the worst in the party, holding them back, allowing the party to salvage some of its great history. We saw this specifically with the reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act. When Reince Priebus's predecessor, Ken Melman, came out and apologized for the Southern strategy and publicly and privately let the Republican senators know that their chairman would be deeply disappointed if they did not vote to reauthorize the Voting Rights Act. Mm -hmm. Currently in front of the Senate and the Congress is the, re is the, is the restoration of Section 5 of the VRA. Mm -hmm. And my question to you is, what is Reince Priebus doing to show that type of leadership that would actually allow you to credibly signal that you want black folks involved in your party and in politics? And what can we expect from him uh, as we look forward to the next Congress and the remainder of this one to actually make sure that the Republicans line up to restore Section 5? Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you uh, for your words and uh, for your question. Um, in terms of the VRA, uh, the lead sponsor of the reauthorization for the Voting Rights Act is a congressman from Wisconsin, Jim Sensenbrenner. He's a political mentor and hero of uh, RNC Chairman Reince Priebus. Um, the bill, in its current form, has bipartisan support, but as we know, anything that's bipartisan takes time to move through the legislative chambers. Um, it, and I will also say that I don't think any demographic group is a one-issue voting population. Uh, and, I, and I know we oftentimes focus on the voting rights issues in this country, but as we've talked about up here on this stage, there are a lot of other issues that are important to black folks now, whether that's economic stability or their, or their personal safety um, or, or community building. And so all that to say what, I mean, Chairman Priebus is committed, he's consciously committed to, to expanding the tent and kicking out anyone who poops in it, so to speak. Uh, and and we've, we've, we've partnered with key stakeholders in the community. He's spoken at the Urban League the past two years. He's been at the National Association of Black Journalists. Uh, we've hired people, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in places like Charlotte and New Orleans and, and Philadelphia who are on the ground and advocates uh, for our message, who look like me and have credibility in their communities. Um, so, I mean, we're ramping up those efforts and it's not, you know, I think our, our biggest challenge as Republicans and black voters is time. And the same way that Janae said 30 years is a short amount of time, like time is not necessarily on our side because we've been absent for so long. And we've got to change that and we have begun that process, but it's not gonna happen overnight. Uh, so, I mean, we'll just continue to make our case as best as we can. And uh, so thank you again. Yeah, I just want to say, Rice Peepers doesn't care about black people. <laughs> no, I'm joking, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> 
Oh, well then, well then I might add that he did clerk for the uh, NAACP Legal Defense Fund out of law school. Okay. And once again, we have about nine minutes, so. Okay. Yeah, um, thank you, but we know anyone who understands neoliberalism and uh, conservative ideology could really, uh, uh, could really contradict most of your talking points very easily. They understand economics. I love to do that, but I don't have time. So let me say this. Um, Martin Luther King talked about restructuring the architecture of society. So at the end of his life, he used radical and revolutionary, uh, those words, quite, quite often. Um, and he was talking about evolving a holistic view. I'm speaking, I guess, to Janae. A holistic view of how do we, what do we want this country to look like, all right? And I'm just offering that. My question is this. There's some, act, some young activists who, who I've heard say that the uh, old guard, civil rights folk uh, uh, don't want to let go. And I want to know uh, if that's your experience, your, what's your view of the charge that the old guard does not want to let go of the, the reins of, of leadership to the, to the new guard? Dr. Hendricks, is that question for me or for Charles? Doesn't matter. I'll be real quick. Um, I think that's the issue. I, I think that at the end of the day, and, and I say this all the time, the old guard, the, the new guard needs to understand that in fact there is a relevance there and that there are lessons to be learned. The old guard needs to understand that sharing the mic or passing the mic does not, leave, does not mean leaving the stage. And that's my answer. And I'll just add really quickly that um, in my personal experience, they have invited people to speak who have then not spoken, or then spoken, and then made comments about not being on the stage. And I'll just say that I, you know, I've seen people like Diane Nash and Bernard Lafayette be incredibly welcoming and give unbelievable advice. And I've also seen people be, like, create space for people and be unbelievably patronizing and paternalistic in those spaces. And there is something about saying, like, I trust you to do the work that I've not seen as many elders who preach that they've been friends of the movement actually do. Um, but there's like a deep paternalism that comes sometimes with, with elders or this like patronizing, like you should just listen to me because I've done it before. And we, st we say like, well, we still not free, right? So something, not that you didn't do it right, but like, you know, we're still fighting so we can learn from you. But like, we remember all the people who did not stand with us in August, right? I, I think about so many people I thought were gonna come down and I remember talking to a congressman and he was like, but DeRay, people told us not to come. And I'm like, people told us to go home and we stayed, right? So there is something about that that is, that is real to so many people. I, I was just relating a personal experience, that's all. Hopefully this will truly be brief. First of all, thank everyone on the panel for having the courage to get in the game and stay in the game. Um, second, uh, uh, as the back half of the baby boomers, um, we knew that we got where we are currently because we stood on other shoulders. Across the panel, what person in, in the civil rights struggle most inspired you or event most inspired you and do you feel most connected to? Thank you. I would say uh, for, for me, it's, it's Mr. Bob Woodson. He's the uh, founder of the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise in Washington, D.C. He's an anti-poverty crusader and activist. He worked with the National Urban League in the 70s. Uh, yes, he is conservative, but he's, uh, he's sort of been a mentor to me in a way and uh, really introduced me to this book by Professor John Sibley Butler. He's a black professor at the University of Texas, Austin. He teaches about entrepreneurship. He has a book. It's called Entrepreneurship and Self-Help Among Black Americans. I recommend everyone pick it up, but Bob Woodson would be my uh, political mentor. Anybody else have a quick one? I'm a two-time Howard University graduate, so I got so I so I got a lot I got a lot of folks I can choose from, um, but I have to go with Charles Hamilton Houston, yeah. by far. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Malcolm X. <laughs> uh, Diane Nash was incredible and continues to give incredible advice. I, I have a lot, a whole more than, than one, um, but right now, Amelia Boynton stands out in my mind. Oh. Oh. Amelia Boynton. Amelia Boynton. Is Amelia Boynton, Boynton Robinson. Yes, Amelia Selma. Boynton. Selma. Yeah. It's a good movie. She's in there Robinson. for a snippet, but she's a real person. <laughs> no, I'm next. Hi, um, 
I'm Abby Ginsberg, the person that Charlene Hunter Galt referred to before with a film called Agents of Change. And I want to say, Charles, that when you commented on it's really about sacrifice, it just really rang a bell because what, the, what our film is trying to capture is what was at stake for people in the late 1960s, you know, largely black with, but with some white allies, in terms of what it meant to kind of go the distance so that the people coming right behind them would not experience the overt racism and everything else that went with that in their early college experience. So I guess my question is really to DeRay, you know, can you say something about how people are thinking about sacrifice, kind of what's on the line? Because the one thing I would say from all the people that are in our film, and not because they carried guns, they did that in self-defense, but people who went the distance to make sure that the black experience was, you know, was reflected on college campuses, did it in part for their younger brothers and sisters. It wasn't just for themselves. Thank you. And, okay, so I, Dere, can you just talk a little bit about how you guys are thinking about and talking about sacrifice and how you think that figures in? Uh, talk a little bit. Okay, <laughs> very yeah, sure. I, I think that like the reality is most people at this point, the issue of police violence is really close to people. Like it's like in their town or those sort of things. I think that people are willing to sacrifice a lot more than they have done right now. So I will, you know, I, I think that people could be way more aggressive real quick if they just got, you know, if somebody said do that. And um, I think that like we haven't yet seen like the 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 end of um, or how intense civil disobedience can be. You know, there are people who want to shut down all of 95 like across like you know up and down the coast, right? Like there, I think there are incredible ways that people can resist. Um, I think that what we had the movement space hasn't done that well yet is like figure out how to invite new people into the protest space because people think protest is like shutting down streets and that is all and that's not true um, and I don't think we've created an invitation that shows people that there's that there are other ways to protest. I think we only have time for two more questions from the audience because I have to have my final question. Yes, sir. Sorry. This is Stan Lawrence. I'm with uh, Revolution Books in Cambridge, and we've been promoting the film tomorrow, the dialogue between Cornell West and Bob Avakian on revolution and religion, the fight for emancipation and the role of religion. Uh, someone mentioned, I think there was a murmur about uh, 30 years is a short time in, in a movement. But when I heard that, I had dual feelings because 30 years of hundreds and hundreds and thousands of brown and black people being killed by the police over the next 30 years is unacceptable. So it, it's just morally unacceptable to all of us. So can people speak to ending it as much as they can in the brief amount of time left? I'll be honest, we've had 400 years of it. Yes. So 30 more is, I mean, in the grand scope of things, is a short amount of time. I'm not saying that it's acceptable, by no means. I know you're but I think in terms of making change, 30 years is a short amount of time to accomplish all the change that we want to see. But, but thank you for your sentiment. Yes, sir, okay. very briefly. I'd like to ask you, which of you are going to vote for Bernie Sanders? And if, which of, and if you aren't, why not? What was the question? I don't know that any of us want to make an endorsement. I'm, not, I'm going to just speak for myself. I'm not making any endorsements right now, but thank you. Okay. Ber Bernie Sanders. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> we know he ain't. Uh, uh, John, John. Go there. Let, let's, no, I really don't no, think we want to go there right now. Let me just take one final question over here, and then we have to close it out. That was a very interesting, um, what do you call it, a question that doesn't ask for an answer, really. Yes, yes. first I want to uh, thank the panel and the people who put uh, this event on. Um, one of the things that is different between your generation and the generation that I'm a part of is that when Clarence Glover, a 10-year-old, was shot in the head and killed by the police, there was no iPhone, there was no pictures, there was nothing along those particular lines that could be sent around the world for people to know what happens to a young black boy when he runs away from the police nor Randolph Evans. So this, this didn't just happen. These are things that have happened. So let me talk about in terms of legacy, because Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is a policy legacy of my generation. What is going to be the policy legacy for your generation? What one thing can you say in terms of your generation, your fight for to make happen? Good question. Thank you. I would love for it to be the N Racial Profiling Act. 
Anybody else? School choice. School choice. Um, I'd like to see a mandatory law for when, a, when the police kill a black person or any person that there be an automatic dismissal from the police department. Can the prosecutor respond to that over there? <laughs> well, no, I, very briefly, I do think that Dion raises an interesting point. You know, when we, we have this whole notion of we dress it up and we call it administrative leave, but let's be honest, when a black man is killed by a police officer, he gets a paid vacation. That's a problem. So I do think that there's some merit with what Dion has talked about. To answer your question, uh, for me, it would be overall criminal justice reform. I know there's, I mean, and, and I can't go more specifically than that because there's so many different things that we need to do to ensure that our criminal justice system works the same way for everyone. I'm going to shortcut now and go to my final question because uh, Skip is looking at his watch. <laughs> it means he's ready to eat. Um, no, I mean, in the next 30 years, we've been talking about 30 years, though, people of color will become the majority in this country. Now, that's not just black people, that's people of color. So what do you anticipate will be your biggest challenge, and will you, to go back to the topic of our uh, uh, conversation today, will you be ready to rule? Janae. I'm in the hot seat. I get all the questions first. Um, I think, I mean, what will be the one challenge? I have problems narrowing things down. It's, I'm a Libra, it's part of my sign, I don't know. Um, um, I, I think there will be a lot of challenges, obviously. I think, um, you know, for black people, we will still, we will not be the majority. And so um, a lot of the issues that we, still, we have now um, will still be working to overcome. Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily see, and I, I wrote about it in the, in the story that I did for um, the website, so feel free to check it out. Um, tweet me with questions, but I don't, what was the second part of the question? I'm sorry. Well, just, just say, will you be ready to rule? I mean, how oh, yeah. different will our lives be with you in charge or people like yourself? Um, you know, I, I, I'm ready to rule. I am ruling. Um, I run an organization. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think in 30 years, I, I hope that, um, you know, there could be more women at this table, um, maybe even all women. And there are a lot of women in the space, I will say that. There are a lot of women doing the work. I have a lot of sister friends in the, in the movement who are doing the work. Um, but, I, you know, I hope that we have had some progress, that we have changed some laws, that we have made the lives of black people in this country better. In our defense, we did have another woman, but she had a, con a serious conflict, which we totally understood. So, but I got your point. Dwayne? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, from a political standpoint, I'm interested in seeing if groups of young people can flip cities, right? Like take a city council and just overturn it, right? Like there's so many cities where um, you don't actually need a ton of votes. And like I am interested to see if like somebody, if a group of people can do that in a way that's really interesting um, and for the right reasons and, and, and like show young people um, that their way to push back against the system is to take it over. Um, so I'm interested in that. In terms of like ready to rule, I struggle with this language of ruling, but um, I'm like interested in and like being a part of how we reimagine power for black young people. Uh, me personally, 30, 30 years from now or whenever it is, I just, I'd like to see people be able to harness the power that they have. Uh, one of the things that I feel like we fail to do a lot of times is really understand how powerful we are as individuals and as groups. So once people of color are the majority, I, I hope we'll be able to understand that we have the power to change things. Like I, I talked about millennials electing Barack Obama, uh, but that was, you know, we came out at all time high rates, but that was 50%. So imagine if 75% or 80% or 90% of us voted, the amount of change that we could actually have and, and affect. And so I just hope that we're able to, people are able to understand the power that they harness, particularly here in America, um, just by being here. And you'll be ready to rule? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I think my, my, part of my goal is to, is to return power to the hands of the people so that they can make their, their, the best decision for themselves and create their own American dream uh, and determine what's best for them. 
in terms of who's ruling, if I'm ruling, if they're ruling, I don't think that that would be a question because you know, there, there are no rulers. There is no two-tiered system of justice or two-tiered system in the economy uh, where some are disenfranchised and others aren't. So I, I, think, I think I'm about democratizing access and, and, giving, and allowing people to have their own agency and uplift. You get the last word. I think the challenge for 30 years from now, the challenge will likely remain our ability to reconcile the conversation on race with the sordid history of race in America. And I think that that's a challenge today and I think that it will remain our challenge and I think that the way that we as a community, particularly a black community, overcome that challenge is to do so through an, a deeper understanding of who we are as a people and moving forward with that level of confidence and having that power restored to us. And so I think it sort of weaves in a lot of what Dion said and even some of what Orlando said, thank God we was able to agree, that it does come down to our ability to empower ourselves to a degree where we can then have full agency over who we are, self-determination, and then writing our own narrative. And as far as being ready to rule, I'm ready to rule and ready to roll. Well, I, I think that what we have managed to talk about today are the complexities in our democracy. And one of the things we didn't uh, say, but I think is implicit in what this conversation has revealed is the prescience of our founders who in the preamble to the Constitution included the clause, a more perfect union. And so clearly, uh, as all of you have said, you don't know what's gonna happen in the next 30 years, uh, given the problems we've had for 400, particularly with respect to black people, 30 years is really a short time. But I think the challenge is for us to understand what it means as human beings to work in a more, towards a perfect union, and even though it can't necessarily get there, all of us should be involved in helping to move towards a more perfect union. Thank you all so very much. <laughs>